Okay. Okay. And Ninja, uh, should we go ahead? Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll introduce Shubhang, you know. Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, today our speaker is Shubhangi Saraf from Rutgers. Shubhangi graduated from MIT a couple of years ago. Uh, she has extremely broad research interests, but uh, probably algebraic complexity and coding theory stands out amongst them. And today she's going to talk about breaking, well, I guess a decade-old barrier of n square improving lower bounds for three query LCCs over the wheels. Uh, before we uh, go ahead with the talk, I'd like to remind that we have uh, remind everyone that there is a uh, we have a good long list of scheduled speakers. So uh, two weeks from now we have Boaz Barak. After that we have Yuri Makarichev, and then uh, Ryan Williams. And on April 9th we have David Woodruff. Uh, now Thomas will go around the table and introduce the groups. All right. Thanks, Ninja. So uh, first we have uh, Akash Kumar and a group from, sorry, Purdue. Is that correct? Uh, we can't hear you. You're muted. Okay. Well, saying hi. Um, then we have uh, Thomas Hollenstein and Shandan Dubey, group from ETH. Welcome, guys. Uh, then we have Grant Skrnebeck and a group from University of Michigan. Hello. Uh, then we have a group from UCSD, I believe. Okay. Hi. And then we have a group from the Simons Institute. Uh, hey, guys. You can hear us, right? Yeah, they can hear us. Okay, good. Uh, and then we have uh, Shavat Rao and a group from NYU. Hi, NYU. And uh, Ninja is our uh, moderator, and we have our speaker. So everyone's here. Um, uh, okay, uh, so oh, just and I like wanted to, to say the, Sorry, oh, just sorry. Say one thing. Oh, that the right. slides, um, Shubangi slides are available on the TCS Plus page, also on the TCS Plus website. So if you want to check out the slides, Download them. They're they're available right now. There's a link. Okay. And uh, just to remind everyone, you will be muted during the talk, but uh, unmute yourself if you want to ask a question and ask a lot of questions. Okay. So over to Shubanki. Okay. So thanks, in India, and thanks to all the organizers for inviting me to give this talk, and thanks to everyone for joining in. Uh, yeah. Please feel free to stop and ask questions, and also if Anything I'm saying is not clear, uh, don't hesitate to stop me. Okay. So I'll be talking about uh, a recent result, which is joint work with Zev Dweer and Avi Vigdesen. And it's about uh, new lower bounds for three query locally correctable codes over the real numbers. OK. So, oops, once. OK, so let me start with a very classical and beautiful result in incidence geometry. This is the sylvester galai theorem. And uh, many of you might have even seen it before. It, the statement is very intuitive and elegant. It says, suppose you have a finite set of points in the two-dimensional Euclidean plane. And suppose this set of points has this very nice property that whenever you take two of the points and then you connect the line through them, it passes through some third point. So you take some other pair of points, the line through them passes through a third. Some other pair, the line passes through a third. And suppose you can, this keeps happening. The only way it's possible, the theorem says, is that the points are all collinear. So the, basically the moment you have a set of points which spans the two-dimensional plane, you must have a line through exactly two points. Yeah? So this sounds very believable and intuitive. And this was conjectured by Sylvester a long time ago in 1893. And it was solved almost 50 years later. And today we know several proofs. And I'll give you a quick outline of one of the proofs, because it's such an elegant proof. And it will be very related to what's coming up later in the talk. So if possible, the sylvester galai theorem is not true. So through every pair of points, um, so you have points spanning all of two dimensions. And whenever you have two points and you join the line through them, it passes through a third point. So let's assume this is true. And such a configuration exists. OK, so this is the clever line in the proof. 
So you have a finite set of points. Through every pair of points, you can consider the line through them. So you get a finite set of lines. And uh, since all the points are not collinear, there is some point which is off some line. So all points, so it's not true that every point is on a line. So you can consider the point line pair with the smallest non-zero distance between them. This exists, you can just take it. And so for instance, suppose L is a line and P is a point and the distance between P and L is the smallest possible. Okay, now this when, how is this line defined? It must have gone through two points. And since this configuration is a Sylvester Galai configuration, this line has in fact three points on it because every line through two points passes through a third. So this line has three points on it. And some two of the points must be on the same side of the foot of the perpendicular, just by the pigeonhole principle. So for instance, uh, if I have my mouse here, so this point and then these two lines are on the same side of the foot of the perpendicular. Now just observe that if you look at the line through P and this far left point, then there's this other point line distance pair which is smaller than the original point line distance pair. The distance is small, became strictly smaller. Right? And that is it, and that's a contradiction. And that's the proof. And why is the new point line, the point line distance smaller than the old one? You get two similar triangles and it's a simple angle chasing. You can just look at it and see that the distance became strictly smaller and this contradicts the fact that we've taken the point line distance, with, uh, point line paired with the smallest distance. Okay, so that is it. So that's the proof of the Sylvester Galai theorem. This tells us that, uh, okay, so you, you, there must be a line through exactly two points. So this is, a, this is a gem of a result. It has several extensions and generalizations which you can look at and study, and several have been studied. So there's extensions to other fields. You can talk about extensions, the quantitative versions of it. There are approximate versions of it, etc. And recently, they've also the Sylvester Galai-like theorems have seen many connections to complexity theory. So. The, there were some recent results connecting it to the structure of arithmetic circuits, and I won't talk any um, uh, talk about that. But even more recently, uh, they've uh, been seen to have a very very uh, tight connection to the problem of locally correctable codes, and this is the connection I'll spend the talk. Uh, we'll talk about it in the rest of the talk. So. This connection to locally correctable codes was for the first time really exploited in, the, in a work by Barak, Dvir, Vigderson, and Yehudayov. And there they used, they studied quantitative versions of the Sylvester Galai theorem. This was a really beautiful result. They studied quantitative versions of this theorem by connecting it to rank bounds for design matrices. And using this, they were able to show that two query locally correctable codes don't exist over the real numbers. These codes don't exist at all. This is a very really nice work. I'll mention it again briefly. Uh, in, we, we, we are, in joint work with Veer and Vigerson, we were able to get even tighter parameters for these results. We also studied approximate versions of these results, and uh, these were... Um, linked to something called stable locally correctable codes over the reals. This was joint work with Albert I, Zev, and Avi. But the result I'll talk about in this talk is a very recent result. Again, joint work with Zev and Avi. It's some combination of a high dimensional and quantitative version of the Sylvester Galai theorem. And this gives us new lower bounds for three query locally correctable codes over the reals. And that's what I'm going to, is going to be the focus of this talk. Okay, so the, what the plan is, I'll uh, tell you about, briefly tell you about some of the extensions of the Sylvester Galai theorem. In particular, I'll tell you about a quantitative version of it, and that, since that would be very relevant for the, the connection to codes. Then I'll tell you what the connection to locally correctable codes is, and then I'll jump into the proof of this new lower bound for three query locally correctable codes. Okay. So any questions? So far? Okay, good. 
So let's uh, let me tell you about the quantitative Sylvester Galai theorem. So recall in the Sylvester Galai theorem, the condition was you have a finite set of points, and and through every pair of points, the line through them passed through a third point. So you had this for every pair of points. The quantitative Sylvester Galai theorem is going to study the setting where you don't know this property holds for every pair of points, but for many pairs of points. For instance, what if what if for every point there are many other points so that the line through them pass through a third? So that's so I'll say a configuration is a delta Sylvester Galai configuration. If for every point their delta fraction of other points, so that if I look at that corresponding pair and extend it to a line, that line passes through a third point. For instance, an example of a delta Sylvester Galai configuration for delta equal to one fourth is a two dimensional grid. You will see in a grid there are many collinear triples, and in fact, it's not hard to see that for every point, if you look at any close by point to it, the line through them will pass through a third point. Okay, so uh, that's a delta Sylvester Galai configuration. So you can get delta, so delta Sylvester Galai configurations for small values of delta, uh, and uh, without the line points all being collinear. But what was shown in this in the work by Barak, Dweer, Vigdison, and Ehude, of which I talked about, is that these configurations can, if you, they cannot be too high dimensional. The moment you have a set of points in R to the d, and suppose they are a delta Sylvester Galai configuration, Barak, Dweer, Vigdison, Yehudayov, they showed that the dimension of the points must be at most 1 over delta square. So it's at most some constant depending on delta. And in joint work with Dweer and Vigdison, we were able to analyze these techniques in a more strengthened way and get a dimension bound of order 1 over delta. And order 1 over delta is tight. So you can uh, get. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so, uh, do you have to take out a few points and then it essentially lies in this dimension? Or no, no, no. So, all exactly. The points do. All the points. All the points are okay. in low dimensions. And the reason that is the case is that the statement of the quantitative Sylvester Galai theorem said for every point, there are many other points so that there's a third line, uh, th that the line passes through a third point. If you have this condition for every point, then the conclusion is also going to be, in fact, every single point is going to be contained in a low dimensional subspace. If you, if you knew it for most points, or if you just knew that a quadratic number of pairs of points is such that the line through them passes through a third, then you would not be able to say that all points are low dimensional. Because you can just toss in some extra points for free and not ruin the condition. But the condition as stated, all the points are in low dimensions, and the dimension now we can show is order 1 over delta, and this is tight. And the reason it is tight is um, that here's an example of a delta Sylvester Galai configuration, which sits in 1 over delta dimensions. Let's take 1 over delta skew lines. So let's pick 1 over delta lines all arranged in, ran in random directions, so they span roughly 1 over delta dimensions. And on each of these lines, let's put delta n points on it. Okay, so now you have delta, delta n points sitting in 1 over delta dimensions. And, these, and it's not hard to see that this is a delta Sylvester Galai configuration. Because for every point, if you just look at the remaining points on the line through it, that would... Uh, these will give you all the collinear triples you are looking for. So this this quantitative Sylvester Galai theorem is tight. Okay, so this is one thing we'll uh, let's remember and we'll come back to it. Okay, one question to this. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yes. So um, in your example, you have even more. You have like one over delta sets of points. Uh -huh. Which all live in one dimension, or uh, is, is this right. general, or is it like? I mean, can right. you always split the That's set of points? That's a great question. That's a great question. I, we don't know the answer to this. So what we've shown is an upper bound on the absolute dimension. But there might be much more structure within the points. Like you said, either there must be maybe a, many collinear points. 
and just giving a dimension upper bound is not capturing the fact that there are many collinear points and we don't know how to answer this question it's an excellent question so the examples we know are basically the grid example and the other example I gave you so it could be that there's actually a lot more structure we just don't the best we know how to do is to prove this dimension upper bound okay. yeah so that, that's, a, that's a very interesting question to see what more you can say about this we do, so I'll, I'll very briefly mention what tools we use but and um, and you'll see why that only gives a dimension bound. Okay, good. So a few words about the proof. So very quickly, let me just spend a, just a slide about it, or two slides maybe. Okay, so you have a delta Sylvester Galai configuration means so you have a many many collinear triples in your set of points. For each collinear triple, we'll construct a matrix. So we'll con construct a matrix where for each collinear triple, we'll add a row to that matrix where in that row of the matrix we'll, we'll put in the coefficients of the linear combination corresponding to that triple. So if three points are collinear, that means those three vectors are linearly dependent. So there is some linear combination of the vectors which sums to zero. And for every row, we'll put it into, put in that linear combination into that row of the matrix for every uh, collinear triple. Good. So we'll construct such a matrix A, which is the matrix of all linear combinations. And let's look at the, the matrix V, where in V you just put all, uh, all the, you arrange all the vectors in the matrix V. And now just notice that A times V equals 0. Second. Sorry. So notice that A times V equals 0. Okay. It turns out that this matrix A, which was the, this matrix of linear uh, co uh, the, the coefficients, turns out to be something which is called a design matrix. And I won't tell you what it is. It's it, um, a design matrix. A matrix is a design. The property of of being a design only depends on the zero non-zero pattern of the matrix. And if you just look at the zero non-zero pattern of this matrix A you'll be able to see that this, so this matrix is a very special matrix. It's a design matrix. Okay, again, I'm not saying what this is, but the goal of the sylvester Galai theorem, this delta sylvester Galai theorem, was to show that the vectors are low-dimensional. So to, sh to show the vectors are low-dimensional, what basically we want to do is to show that the rank of the set of vectors is small. This vector matrix, we want to show it has small rank. We know that a times v equals 0. So if we show that A has very large rank, and since A times V is 0, this will imply that V has very small rank. So the, so the outline of the proof is to consider this matrix of uh, coefficients, observe that it is something called a design matrix, and then show that a design matrix must have very large rank. So that was the outline Good. of the proof. Sorry, quick yeah. question. Um, yeah. Can you just yeah. say, you're not saying what the design matrix is, that, that's fine, but um, so the fact that it's a design matrix, that, that just follows from the definition of Sylvester Galai set of points, or what? Just, just from the property? It, it follows, so it, it, it yes, it just follows from the Sylvester Galai. I'm cheating a little bit. You need to throw out some rows of the matrix to make it a design, but it's almost a design, and the only thing you use for it being a design is that every two lines intersect at one point. So this... Okay. So uh, yeah, okay. I'm being very high level about it, just to give you a flavor of the proof, and I don't want to get too much into it. A design matrix, okay, let me just say it, a design matrix is a matrix where every column has many non-zero entries, and every pair of columns, if you look at the supports of the non-zero entries of a pair of columns, their intersection is small. That's okay. what a design matrix is. And if you stare at this matrix, a little bit of pruning of it will make you quite easily see that it's a, it's already almost a design matrix. You can make it a design matrix and then lower bound the rank. So let me not say more about this right now. So, so that was the proof for the two query, so this the delta Sylvester Galai. Let me tell you another version of the Sylvester Galai theorem, which is again related to the question on codes which is coming up. 
So the Siras the Galai theorem, as I stated it, was a statement about points and lines. So the line through every pair of points passes through a third, and so on and so forth. You can ask us uh, more generally, you can ask a question about points and hyperplanes. Or for instance, so here is a statement, a high dimensional version of the Sylvester Galai theorem, which was proved in the 60s, which says, suppose you have a finite set of points in some Euclidean space. And suppose if you look at every k points, and you can look at the hyperplane, or you can look at the k minus 1, you can look, what do I, what do I want to say? Right. So for every k plus 1 points, you can look at the k-dimensional plane which passes through it. If you look at the k-dimensional plane passing through k plus 1 points, and if it always has a k plus second point on it, if your set of points is such, then the statement says the points must be low dimensional, so roughly 2k dimensional. Okay, so, so the statement which is on the slide says, if your points span at least 2k dimensions, then you can't, it cannot be that for every k, uh, uh, k plus 1 points, if you look at the, the plane through it, it contains a k plus second point. There must be some k plus 1 points, so that if you look at the k-dimensional plane, it spans, that plane contains no other points. And when k equals 1, this is exactly the Sylvester Galai theorem. Okay, so this was this is a version of the theorem which was proved then. This proof is much trickier and much more involved than the original proof of the Sylvester Galai theorem. It's it's much more complicated. Uh, these works, the delta Sylvester Galai, the proof technique used for the delta Sylvester Galai theorems, these are actually robust enough to even um, give a, a reprove the same theorem but with slightly worse parameters and also at the same time give an extension of this theorem to the complex numbers. But the bounds we obtain for extensions to the complex numbers, these are very far from being optimal. Me sorry. Okay, so that's the high-dimensional Sylvester Galai theorem. So we know the quantitative one, we know the high-dimensional one. Now let me tell you, given both these uh, things, let me tell you what the connection to locally correctable codes is of all these Sylvester Galai theorems. Okay, so let me define what a locally correctable code is. So, the, so we'll be talking only about linear locally correctable codes. So the code is defined by a generator matrix. So let G be a generator matrix. It's a K by N matrix. So it will take uh, messages of which are K symbols long and map them to message to code words which are N symbols long. So for instance, you'll take a message M. The way you use, uh, you get an encoding of the message is to multiply it with G and you will get a longer vector which is n symbols long. Okay, so now the, what's the, the, scenario, is the scenario we have in coding theory is that now some, you take a code word and now some corruptions occur or there's an adversary who comes and corrupts a small fraction of the code word coordinates and you still want to recover what the original message is in spite of this uh, corruption. Okay, so the, the adversary came, corrupted some code word coordinates. So what you get after the corruption is something we'll call the received word, which is the corrupted code word. And so I'm using the, the uh, vector r to denote this received word. We'll say a code is a Q delta LCC a Q delta locally correctable code. Here delta is going to refer to the fraction of errors made. Q will refer to the number of queries made. Okay, so you want to, in a locally correctable code, be able to recover the true value of any location of the code word by only looking at very few uh, locations of the corrupted code word. So with high probability, for instance, you might want to recover the ith location of the true code word, which is m.pi. 
you want to recover it but you want to make only q queries into r to do it where r has been you the received word is come from the true code word by making some arbitrary delta fraction corruptions of the code word okay so for instance so here's how a q delta uh, locally correctable code decoder would work you give it you feed it some symbol i so you tell it i want the true ith coordinate of the code word the true i the true value written at the ith location of the code word the decoder will maybe toss some coins query some q locations of the corrupted code word and tell you what the value at the ith coordinate is which should be m dot pi where pi is the ith column of the generator matrix right so that's how it should work notice the following okay so now for instance think that think of q to be something like 3 so to recover every coordinate of the uh, 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 true value of the code word true coordinate of the code word we are we are querying three other locations of uh, the code word to tell you what the value is at the ith location so for instance if the j k and lth locations were used to tell you what the value is at the ith location just observe that the corresponding four columns of the generator matrix must be linearly dependent pi must be in the linear span of pj pk and pl because if pi was not in the linear span of pj pk pl then the values you have at j k and l those locations are completely independent of the value you will get at pi for when the message is arbitrary so the only way you the i the j k l th locations can tell you the value at the i th location is that the corresponding four columns of the generator matrix are linearly dependent or pi is in the span of p j p k and p l okay in fact okay so if it's this is a an and a q delta l c c when q is 3 so p i must be in the linear span of some three columns it must be in actually in the span of many triples of columns because if it was in the span of just one uh, just pj pk and pl the adversary could go corrupt one of the jk or lth locations and then there is no hope of recovering what the value at pi is if one of the jk or lth locations are corrupted uh, shubangi Yes. Does this argument suppose that the queries are non-adaptive? Uh, no, so it's not assuming uh, adaptivity or non-adaptivity, nothing. So it's just that if um, if PJPKPL did not span PI, then... Uh, no, the, 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 the one you said where it must lie in many triples. Oh, no, no. So because uh, you never, you don't know if there's an error or not right so when I okay. query three locations I don't know if there was an error or not so uh -huh. I won't know if I get the true value at I okay. but the hope is this suppose there were many 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 triples used to decode uh, the ith location then most of them will remain uncorrupted many of the triples might get corrupted but most will remain uncorrupted mm -hmm. and so if you pick a random triple with high probability it will tell you the correct value at the ith location oh, yeah. so okay. that's the hope so it's uh, so in pi yeah, so if in particular if this is a 3 delta lcc for every location i pi must be in the linear span of some pj pk pl in fact it it must be in the linear span of at least something like delta times n disjoint triples pj pk pl why disjoint? Because if all these triples shared a few coordinates, I'll just corrupt those coordinates and then I'll ruin a lot of triples. So there must be many, many disjoint triples per coordinate. Per each PI must be in the linear span of many disjoint triples. So let's get, uh, let's plot, let's get a more geometric interpretation of what's going on. We can take all these columns of the generator matrix these are vectors of length k because the matrix was a k by n matrix let's take all these vectors and plot them as points in k dimensional space 
So for what, whichever field you are working over, you can just take your vectors, uh, your the columns of your generator matrix, view them as vectors. And now what we see is, so we get n vectors or n points. And the property of being an LCC said that for every point, every PI, there are many triples. There are many disjoint Q tuples, something like delta fraction, maybe delta, delta over 2, up to, up, to, up to constant factors. There will be delta n disjoint Q tuples, such that PI will be in the linear span of those Q tuples. And this happens for every point. So this other green point, you'll have a different disjoint set of Q tuples decoding that point. No matter which point you choose, you'll have many disjoint Q tuples spanning that point. Good. So in pair. So in particular, for every I, every PI, there was a matching of Q tuples decoding it. And so we get n different matchings, one corresponding to each point. Okay. Recall now that when Q equals 2, so that means for each point you have many disjoint two tuples spanning that point. This is exactly the property of being a delta Sylvester Galai configuration. So the property of being a two, del two delta LCC is equivalent to being a delta Sylvester Galai configuration. Right? And now we just want, and for that we understand, we, we understand the dimension bounds pretty well. These such configurations can only exist in constantly many dimensions. And that tells us a lot about two query locally correctable codes over the real numbers. Good. Okay, so, so let's, let me tell you, so these locally correctable codes, they've played a very important role in complexity theory. So they played a central role in program testing, in the PCP theorem, in IP equals P space. So they've, they've played a very important role, but we still understand extremely little about it. So on the, in the positive side, the only examples we know of these codes are the Hadamard code and the Reed-Muller code. Basically, we don't, almost don't know any other example. And on the lower bound front, we're just very, very weak lower bounds known. So the, and there was an interesting result of Dwir, which shows that if you can show even very mild lower bounds for polylog query LCCs, this would imply new lower bounds for matrix rigidity. But we, uh, it seems that we're quite far from understanding going up to polylog query LCCs. And I'll tell you why. So let me tell you what we already know. So let me tell you what we know about two query LCCs. So the only example we know is the Hadamard code for two queries. And in fact, it was basically shown over finite fields that this is the best you can do. So the result by, by Goldreich, Karloff, Schulman, and Trevisan over F2 showed that basically the Hadamard code is the only example. So the length of the code, n, needs to be at least 2 to the k, where k was the message length. And in recent work with uh, Bhattacharya, Dvir, and Spilka, we also showed that n needs to be at least p to the k for fields of characteristic p. The result, so by Barak, Dvir, Vigdesen, and Yehudayov, this delta Sylvester Galai result basically shows that over the reals, these codes cannot exist because these configurations of points can only exist in constant dimensional space, which means k needs to be a constant. So you can't have a family of codes with growing k, which are a two query LCC over the reals. So over the real number, so, so basically for two query locally correctable codes, we seem to understand the situation fairly well. Over the reals, they don't exist. Over F2 and FP, we have matching upper bounds and lower bounds. Let's go to three query LCCs. Okay, so now instead of uh, for every point, there are many disjoint two tuples. Now for every point, there are many disjoint three tuples spanning that point. On the upper bound uh, side, the only examples we know are the Reed-Muller codes. And 
for for instance over f2 that gives us a construction where n is 2 to the square root k okay, so still exponential but better than hadamard over the real numbers we have no examples so there are no constructions known and on the lower bound front the lower bounds are much much weaker so the best construction was say over f2 something like 2 to the square root k the best lower bounds we know over any field are just n needs to be at least k square so there is this huge gap this best construction is n is 2 to the square root k the best lower bound is n needs to be at least k square so this is uh, Goldreich, Karloff, Schulman and Trevisan gave the first lower bounds and then Woodruff uh, made it k square uh, over log k and then in 2010 he even removed the log factor so k square is the best lower bound which is known this result which I'm going to talk about is going to make just a very modest improvement over this n greater than k square lower bound what we show with Dweer and Vigdesen is over the real numbers we are able to push this k square to a k to the 2 plus epsilon for some small constant epsilon epsilon something like 1 over 1000 so that's what we do it's um, breaking the quadratic barrier in a sense because many proof techniques came and got stuck at the k square so you can get the k square bound now by thinking in a lot of different ways but this everything seemed to get stuck at k square we we just break the k square we go to k to the 2 plus epsilon but we also only do this over the real numbers and notice over the real numbers we have no constructions so there is no upper bound so potentially you can get much stronger lower bounds so we do this only over the reals and this improvement is a k square goes to the k to the 2 plus epsilon so that's the situation. Uh, yeah. Uh, Shubangi, so uh, over finite fields, there are there no analogs of the Sylvester Galai theorem or so, over finite fields? Good question. So the Sylvester Galai theorem, as stated, is not true over the finite fields. But since the Sylvester Galai theorem is basically equivalent to to query locally correctable codes, whatever up and we have, we have matching upper bounds, lower bounds. So this two query look so basically if you look at f2 to the k and you take all points in f2 to the k sorry my other screen keeps switching off um, if you take all points in f2 to the k then that's 2 to the k points which are a Sylvester Galai configuration so you get points which are not collinear but the line through every pair of points passes through a third so at least as stated there is no Sylvester Galai configuration but you can perhaps say something that the points must, if you have n points, they must be in at most log n dimensions. You can make statements like that, and that's equivalent to the question of locally correctable codes and bounds for that. Good. Okay, so, so back to this result we'll talk about is going beyond, so n being at least k to the 2 plus epsilon. So that's the result, and now for the rest of the talk, I'll tell you about what ideas go into the proof for this result. Good. So again, let's go back to the geometric question. We had n points in some k-dimensional Euclidean space. And what we know is that for every point pi, there is a matching. There are delta n disjoint three tuples spanning pi. Okay. And this you know for every point, there's some matching which spans it. For yeah, the green point, now there's another matching of triples spanning it. The earlier results, the earlier lower bounds on the on three query LCCs basically amount to saying that whenever you have such a special configuration of n points in Euclidean space, every point spanned by many three tuples, the result by Woodruff says that oh, such a the only way such a uh, configuration can exist is that the dimension has to be at most square root n. The n points, they must sit in at most square root n dimensions. That's the earlier result. What we show is the dimension must be at most n to the 0.499. What is possible and which we believe is true but we don't know how to show is that the dimension is actually at most a constant. 
depending on delta. So I have a question. So yeah? in, in your result, how does delta come in, or is this kind of independent of delta? Oh, great, or? great, great question. So if delta is a constant, so as long I think is as n is more than one over delta. So a del if delta, so delta can't be really small. So n needs to be little omega of one over delta. And as long as that happens, we get an n to the 0 0.499 bound. It might okay, be something so like poly 1 over delta times n to the 0.499. So it, the delta becomes insignificant. If n is much larger than delta, then the exponent we get is some fixed constant bounded away from a half. But, but in particular, I mean, k smaller than n to the 0 0.499 holds for any constant delta. Any constant delta, yes. And actually, delta could be probably very sub-constant as well, and even then, it would hold. Yeah, and what I said is, if, if for when delta is constant, like the best we can show is n to the 0.499, what might be possible is that the dimension is actually constant. And that would be a very, very nice result. But we don't know what to do. On the other hand, it's not clear that something simple might not do it. But it just... Uh, yeah, that was this was the best we could do. But this is a very interesting question, just because it's so much in it's so similar to the two query question, and we understand that so completely. And the moment you go to three queries, suddenly the best upper bounds and lower bounds are well apart, and we understand much little, much less, the moment you we got to this setting. So let me so let's. Uh, Get, get, get into the ideas and the proof. What we'll first do, so we want to show that k is at most n to the 0.499. As a first step, let's show why k is less than square root n. And uh, we, I'll give a different proof of this result from the proofs known in the past. We'll show k is something less than square root n polylog n. The O tilde, I'm hiding polylog factors right now. And this is a different proof from the proofs of the past, but this proof is nice because it is it is going to be the proof that we will generalize to get the improved bound. So let's show why k is at most square root n. And the main idea in the proof is we will look at this set of points and we will apply a random projection to these points. And by random projection, I mean we'll pick some set of points at random this will be the set S. And then we'll take this set of points and we'll set, we'll apply a linear transformation which sends this set of points to zero. So we'll apply a, a linear transformation A where the kernel of A is the span of that set of points. So all those points went to zero. So what happens when you do that? The dimension of the code will reduce by at most the size of s because the kernel the, the the kernel the dimension of the kernel is at most the size of s okay so the dimension went down the hope is by doing this process something nice happens to the code it simplifies in some manner okay so what so what more precisely what we'll do is we'll pick square root n points at random and we'll set them to zero Okay, so the dimension reduced by at most square root n, right? Good. Now ob observe this, a very nice thing happens when you send square root n points to 0. The claim is, so for, for every point there were a linear number of triples which spanned it. The claim is with pretty decent probability one of these triples, two of the point, one of these triples will have two of the points selected amongst the square root n points. Why? So for every triple, the probability that two points get chosen is roughly 1 over n. And if the number of triples is a linear number of triples, uh, with constant probability, one of these triples will have two of their points chosen. Okay, so good. So we pick square root n points. It's very 
it's very likely that one of the triples, for instance, this triple had two of its points which got chosen. When we send those two points to zero, so the, you, the triple originally spanned pi. When two of the points got sent to zero, what happened is a third point must still continue to span pi. So the third point basically gets added, becomes the same as pi or a scalar multiple of pi. But let's not distinguish between vectors and scalar multiples of vectors. Right? So when we send square root n points to 0, for each pi or basically for most pi, a triple got replaced by a singleton and pi got identified by that point in that triple. Right? And this happens for most pi. At least a constant fraction of the pi. Okay, so okay, so when that happens, notice that the size of the set shrinks by a constant factor. Because for every pi which got identified by another point, those two points became the same point basically. So the size of the set shrank. And now let's repeat this process log n times. Each time you lose something in the dimension and the size of the set will shrink. Okay, so let's see why this makes sense. What do you mean by repeat log n times? The first time we did it, maybe the second time something goes wrong. So let's understand again why can you repeat log n times. Let's, so let's, let me do this a little more slowly. So what happened? Each, when you set square root n points to 0, each pi got or most PIs got identified with some other point. But that other point which it got identified with was an almost uniformly random other point. Right? It wasn't the same fixed other point. When we set square root n points to 0, any of those triples had an, each, each of those triples had an equal probability of becoming a singleton. So basically if you look at all the points coming in all the triples, PI could have gotten mapped to any of them with basically the same probability. So each pi got mapped to a basically uniformly random other point. And this happens again per pi. Good. The dimension reduced by square root n. And so clearly the number of elements shrank by a constant factor. Right? The number of distinct elements in your set shrinks. Sorry, Shubangi, can you say again what you mean by pi gets identified with a point? I, I'm not getting this. You're deleting points. And then we're, not, we're not deleting anything. We, ident we ap applied a linear transformation which set some points to zero. Nothing gets deleted. We keep all the points around. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. We kept all the points around. We just applied a linear transformation on the entire set of points. Some points got mapped to zero. But if a triple got mapped to two of the points, in a triple, there were four points which were linearly dependent. Two of them got mapped to zero. Then the remaining two become the same point or scalar multiples of the same point and we're not distinguishing between scalar multiples so let's say we've, we've scaled it all to be unit vectors so uh, so pi so after this linear transformation pi got gets identified two points come and stick to each other and because two points came and stuck to each other and this happened per point or most points, the, the size of the set shrinks or the number of distinct elements of the set at least shrank. But let's remember, the, a set became a multi-set now. Two points might get identified, but let's remember all the points. Let's not delete anything or throw away anything. Let's keep the entire set around. Only now some two vectors, they became the same vector. Good. Observe that after we apply this linear transformation, this new set, which is now maybe a multi-set, it's still an LCC. Right? Whatever was originally linearly dependent is still linearly dependent. Only now we have some repeated coordinates. Point, at the same point, you could have two vectors. That's all we're saying. But we've not removed any of the linear dependencies in the set of points. And so the LCC structure remains absolutely the same. Only now you have repeated coordinates. This corresponds in the generator matrix. You might have repeated columns, which is OK. 
Okay, so you apply this linear transformation, the dimension shrinks, the number of elements, distinct elements goes down, but you still have an LCC. And since you still have an LCC, we can just apply the same argument again. Now, it's still true that every point has a linear number of triples. It's the same original linear number of triples, the same triples. We're not throwing those triples away. And we'll, th we'll pick another square root n points and set it to 0. OK, now for every pi, when we, set, when we send the second square root n point, set of se square root n points to 0, Every pi will now again get mapped to a random other point. Either the random other point was already identified with pi, but then the size of pi won't, the pi will just remain what it is, or that random other point was a distinct point, and then those there'll be a further collapse. Right? So uh, when so, but since the other point is such a ra as a random point, or a basically random point, if the number of if the number of points is large, if the number of distinct points is large, if you pick a pi and you pick a random other point to map it to, the size of the set is going to shrink more. Right. So you started with a set of points, you identified some pairs, so it became a slightly, the number of distinct points went down. Now for each point, you're again mapping it to a random point. And this, the size of the set will go down some more. Each time, as long as the number of components or the number of distinct points is more than a constant, each PI will get with high probability mapped to a distinct other point. And so there'll be a collapse in the number of distinct elements. And so if you and so you can keep repeating this process. So you let's do it log n times. Each time the size, the dimension goes down by further square root n, and the size of the set shrinks by another constant factor. And so what happens? So each x, so each iteration dimension goes down by square root n, number of distinct elements shrinks by a constant. If you repeat it log n times, the dimension will shrink by at most square root n log n. And since, and the number of distinct elements which will remain is at most a constant. Because you started with n distinct elements and it went down by constant factor and you did this log n times. So in the end only constantly many elements remain. So the end dimension is only constant. Right? So the original dimension must be at most square root n log n. Because you started with some dimension, you went down square root n log n dimensions, and you were left with constant dimensions. So originally, you must have started out with at most square root n log n dimensions. Yeah. So, and so, so that, I have a question. Yes. So did this will this argument also work? Is this the argument just for the reals, or is no? It so this is for all fields. So we didn't use any property of the reals exactly. So this gives an argue. This gives a the square root n log n lower bound uh, bound, which works over no matter for all fields. Okay. Good. So so that's uh, okay. Good. So that's the dimension bound we have. Now we want to we want to improve upon this argument, right? We want to get a dim, uh, an upper bound on the dimension being something like n to the point 0.499. And the way we got this bound, we, were, we kept sending square root n things at a time to ra at random to 0. Maybe, maybe if you can look, instead of sending things at random to 0, maybe you can look carefully at these triples and more cleverly send things to 0 and gain in some way, perhaps. But it's easy to see that, in general, you will not be able to improve this argument. You, it's, it's easy to see that you should not be able to carefully choose a smaller set of points, send, this, send a smaller set of points to 0, and hope for any noticeable collapse. For instance, if these triples, if you didn't know any structure about these triples, if these, triples, if these matchings per point were somewhat randomly arranged, if you send less than square root n points to 0, no triple will become a singleton. 
or it, maybe you cleverly choose it so that some trip will become the singleton but most triples will remain untouched and you won't be able to get a collapse so without further information on the structure of the triples at least this argument seems not possible to improve so but what we show in our paper is is the following we want to show the dimensions at most n to the point 499 what we show is if possible let's say the dimension is large it's more than n to the point 499 then we show that the triples in our lcc must be extremely structured and once we see that these triples are really structured we will exploit the structure to do the random restriction process better so that's going to be the goal we'll first show a structure theorem and then we'll use the structure to get improved random restriction okay so here is so this is what the, this is the structure theorem we are going to prove we we'll say if k is more than n to the point 499 then we show that these are n points must be very nicely clustered we can find roughly square root n clusters each containing square root n points so that every triple every triple and every matching must intersect some cluster in two points so you won't have triples where one you have three points each coming from a different cluster you won't get such structure so what you will get is these triples intersect these clusters heavily you know so that's the structure theorem square root n clusters with square root n points each triple intersects the cl uh, some cluster in two points why this gives you a better random restriction i'll come to soon but let's first uh, get uh, let me give you the main idea in the structure theorem in the how do, how does one prove such a structure theorem so the main tool we will use in the proof of the structure theorem is a very nice result from convex geometry it's a result by barth which has so this this statement is a very nice statement by itself something to take away from this uh, talk So this result says that if you have n points in R K, and suppose these points are nicely spread out, in the sense that there is no large subset of the points which sits in a low-dimensional subspace. So there's no maybe there's no epsilon fraction of the points which sits in epsilon prime and k dimensions. So they are all nicely spread out. Then You, you can apply an invertible linear transformation to your points so you'll apply an invertible linear transformation and then you'll scale the points to make them unit vectors and after you apply this transformation and scaling these points become nice and well spread in in some sense isotropic so basically they become well spread in the sense that for every unit vector w if you look at the sum of squares of inner products w has with all the the new pi's then the sum of squares is small it's at most order n over k and for instance this is the bound you would get if all your points were random unit vectors yeah. okay so so that's the result this is the result we will be using the precise statement of the result by barth was something slightly uh, in it was it was in a different language and we we phrase it in this language to get our bounds but basically so let me not get into that if no large subset is in a low dimension then you can apply a transformation and a scaling which spreads the points out the tr this uh, transformation observe that applying an invertible linear transformation to a set of points preserves the property of being an lcc also uh, the scaling to make it unit also preserves the property of being an lcc so after applying this barth transformation we still have an lcc but now we have the good property that the points are all well spread 
and in particular no point correlates with too many other points or more precisely for every point that at most so since we assumed that the dimension is at most uh, mm, is at least n to the point 499 we know that for every point there are at most n to the 0 0.501 points which correlate with that point which have any constant correlation with that point Okay, so, so what? So by applying this result by Barth, we 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 transform our LCC so that at most n to the point five zero one points correlate with any point. So we have so these points are basically very orthogonal. That means most pairs of points in our set of points are very orthogonal. But notice that when you have a locally correctable codes code, you also have many correlated pairs of points. Because whenever three points span a fourth point, whenever you have four points which are linearly dependent, you must have two of the points which have a constant correlation with each other. They can't, if four points were almost orthogonal, then they would span four dimensions. They wouldn't span three dimensions. So the moment you have a linear dependency, you get some two points must correlate. And thus, since you have omega n squared dependent four tuples in your LCC, because per point you have lots of three tuples spanning it. So we have omega n squared dependent four tuples. This will give us omega n squared four tuples, each which has some correlated pair sitting inside it. So you have a lot of correlated pairs. At the same time, you know that each point correlates with very few other points. So uh, now it remains to see how can these two confl conflicting constraints coexist. That each point correlates with very few others, but there are lots of correlated pairs sitting inside the, uh, the dependent four tuples. And our structure theorem will basically say the only way these two conflicting constraints can coexist is the structure theorem we mentioned. How much time do I have? Um, it depends. I'm sorry. Yeah, we How started a we little. Uh, so it's been yeah, an hour now, 10, 10 so um, I, I think some people have to go maybe depending, so okay. I, I don't know if you have a lot more or you can um, sort of say what's coming up and... Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do... Okay, so, so maybe seven, eight minutes is okay? Yeah, um, that should be okay. Okay, I okay. Think, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Maybe just give us a glimpse. So I give you first a high level. I give you a high level. So for anybody, yeah. everybody who wants to leave, and then if anybody wants to stay for details, I'll do another five minutes after that. So the high okay, level is okay. So the high level is that okay. So we have, we want to say that how can these conflicting constraints coexist? The only way is the structure theorem I mentioned. Okay, so then I was going we was going to prove the structure theorem, which ends here. Be so, okay, so there was a structure theorem which we get by, exp by by looking at how you get correlated triples. At the same time, you have a lot of orthogonal pairs. From this, we basically construct a graph of uh, all the correlated pairs and show that this the, by looking at the graph theoretic properties of all pairs which are correlated, we see that this graph must cluster into disjoint pieces. With you will have square root n clusters of square root n points. And within these clusters, mo most of the correlated pairs will sit within these clusters. And, and whenever every triple decodes to a point, since there must be some correlation within it, that correlated pair of that triple will sit within, wholly within a cluster. So what we'll get is square root n clusters with square root n points. These clusters will be end up being almost orthogonal to each other. And within a cluster, all the points will be very correlated. So we get root n clusters sitting in root n dimensions. Every pair very orthogonal, but within a cluster they'll be closed by points. That's going to be the structure we get. And every triple will have a correlated pair, and that correlated pair must sit within a cluster. You can't break up that triple uh, within many clusters. So that's what we'll get. So, the, so let me just finish up by just saying how this... Uh, uh, by saying what, uh, once we have this uh, uh, clustering, how this implies an improved random restriction. 
Okay, so we had square root n triples, square root n clusters. And what we know is that for every triple, there are two points in the triple which sit inside some cluster. Good. So for each pi, notice that there are roughly n or linear number of triples. And these are disjoint triples. And so these n triples, each triple must intersect some cluster. So on average, there are square root n triples which intersect the first cluster, square root n triples which intersect the second cluster, and so on and so forth. And these triples are all disjoint. Right? And each triple intersects a cluster in a pair of points. So basically, what we get is for each cluster, P, for corresponding to pi, we'll get square root n edges within that cluster, corresponding to how that triple intersected the cluster. Okay, so once you have this uh, structure where you have uh, triples which intersect these clusters heavily, this is how we do the improved random restriction. So earlier on, we picked square root n points completely at random and set them to zero. Now what we'll do is, let's, we won't pick so many points, we'll pick much fewer points. We'll first pick a cluster at random, and then we'll pick n to the one-fourth points from that cluster and send it to zero. Okay, so we've set, sent much fewer points to zero, but let's see what happens when you do that. The dimension reduces at most by n to the one-fourth. That's clear. And let's show that everything else remains the same. It's still true that f for each pi, or for most pi's, some triple becomes a singleton with high probability, and pi gets identified by another point. And this point is pretty random. If we can show this, then we are basically done. That the size of the set will shrink by a constant factor, and the dimension went down by at most n to the one fourth. Okay, so let's see why that happens. When we pick a so each each point has about so when we pick a random cluster, and we'll pick n to the one fourth points in this. Suppose that the third cluster got picked. Now a particular point pi has about square root n triples which intersect that cluster in two points. Right? So suppose we're looking at the triples corresponding to pi. They have square root n edges in that cluster. It's a cluster with square root n, roughly square root n vertices. It has roughly square root n edges within it corresponding to the point pi. And when we set n to the one-fourth things to zero, the probability that you pick both endpoints of some edge is constant. Right? Per edge, it's about 1 over square root n. And then you have square root n edges. So with, cons with so one of the edges will get picked with constant. So with this constant probability that for one of the edges, you'll pick both endpoints. And that means so one of the triples gets mapped to a, two of the points get sent to zero, only one point remains, and pi gets identified with it. And there was nothing special about i. This happens for each pi. And so the size of the set shrinks by a constant factor, and the dimension now went down by much less, only n to the one-fourth. And so now let's repeat it log n times. And that's it. So you got your improved random restriction because you set much few. Now you just sent much fewer points to zero, and uh, the dimension became a constant. Okay, that, so that was the improved random restriction, once you have the structure theorem. Why is the lower bound, why is the bound not n to the one-fourth log n? Why is it n to the point 0.499? That's because to prove the structure theorem, we said, if possible, the dimension is more than n to the point 0.499. And then we applied the result by Barth, and there we needed the dimension to be large. So we used that the dimension was large to get the structure theorem. Once we have the structure theorem, we get a contradiction easily, because if the dimension, by sending just n to the one-fourth log n things to zero, we made the dimension go down to constant. Okay, so that's, so let me just uh, summarize. 
So what happened was, okay, so we saw many variations of the sylvester galai theorem, where local dependencies between the points implies a global dimension on the overall set of points. And these sylvester galai like th theorems, they are very similar in flavor to many of the results from additive combinatorics. For instance, the freiman ruja theorem, which says that uh, Whenever you have a lot of additive structure or a lot of triples in your syst uh, set system, so if, a, so if there are a lot of pairs of points such that their sum lies within the set, then the set must have a lot of structure or be very low dimensional. And these sylvester galai theorems are very similar in flavor to these results from additive combinatorics. And in fact, some the you can prove low bounds for locally correctable codes using this connection to additive combinatorics. So the lower band we had with Bhattacharya, Dvir, and Shpilka showing uh, improved lower bands for two query LCCs over FP, in fact, used these results from additive combinatorics to understand the structure of locally correctable codes. So it would be very interesting to see if something more can be said or the connection between the sylvester galai theorems and additive combinatorics can be strengthened. So again, we uh, the main point was we understand very, very little the moment we go to high dimensions. So the two query version was much better understood. Three dimensions we understand much less. And the main open questions are perhaps to get, uh, so one interesting question is are bounds only worked over the real numbers? So it would be very interesting to see if you can get better lower bounds for three query LCCs over F2. So some parts still work. All the random restriction arguments didn't depend on the field. But the th clustering theorem was heavily depending on, on the real numbers. In particular, the result by Barth, which talked about correlations between points. That heavily used properties of the real numbers. So we would need to get, perhaps prove some kind of structure theorem without using convex geometry. And then we could probably extend this to F2. Yeah, so our results were again very, uh, I mean, so probably very far from optimal. There's probably no three query LCCs over the reals. And so it's a very interesting question to see if something can be done there. Three query, this was all about three queries. You can ask questions for more queries. So what happens for four queries, five queries, or more query codes? What can you take away from this result? And again, there are a lot of components which continue to work. So all these, the result by Barth, the ideas of correlations, all this did not use anything about the three queries. So this also extends uh, to many queries, but then there are many ideas which also break down, which we haven't really managed to get time to see in too much detail. And getting lower bounds for more queries is a very interesting direction because so I mentioned the result by Dweer. So these lower, these lower bounds for LCCs are very connected to lower bounds for matrix rigidity and lower bounds for arithmetic circuits. And these questions have been very well studied. And it would be interesting to see if we can push the lower bounds for LCCs enough to get anything meaningful in this regime. And I didn't talk about stable Sylvester Galai too much, so I won't say anything about this. So let me end. Now, take any questions if there are. Thank Thanks, you. Shumanthi. Thanks, Thank you. So, what's what are the parts which will break down if you try to go for like the, like let's say four queries, like. Uh, so one thing that really breaks the most important thing which breaks down is the random in the random restriction argument we said to we we have to shrink the size of the set we had a triple and two of the points got set to zero and right. then pi got mapped to the third point so now to go to four queries we would need to set many more points to zero to hope to hit three of the points uh, out of okay, a Okay, even the time. vanilla argument won't work. The, right. the vanilla argument right. mimicking the quadratic barrier, that won't work. Okay. Right, 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 right. So do we have other questions from the audience?
Uh, and also one more question. So yeah. this extends to complex numbers, right? Uh, uh, no, result? this result doesn't extend because the result by Barth doesn't work over the complex oh. numbers. So the, all the two query results which I talked about, the lower bounds for the delta Sylvester Galai configurations for two queries, all that works over the complex numbers. But these techniques are use the reals heavily. The bots, okay. Yeah, that doesn't work over complexes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks a lot. Um, and India, maybe I'll stop the live broadcast. We can still stay yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, I think let's stop the, let's stop the live broadcast. Thanks, Shubhangi. You're welcome.